Well, thank you. It's great to be here, and it's an honor to be to have shared a stage with uh, so many inspiring and visionary young people, and a little older people too. <laughs> and now that you've uh, had your deep sleep tutorial, um, I think it's time to wake up because we've got big problems, and I'm going to give you a certain angle on those big problems and how I think they should, we can deal with it. The, the theme of this meeting is imagine that. So what am I asking you to imagine? I'm asking you to imagine, and this is the title of my book, for which I just got the first copies today, actually, uh, Democracy When the People Are Thinking. Now, how counterfactual is that? Uh, and I'll explain what I mean. Ah, that's, I'll learn how to use this technology. OK. Uh, I, this will sound a little academic at first, but I actually have a very simple story to tell. Uh, because I want to describe a problem, describe the solution, in my view, describe how we've been applying the solution all over the world, and maybe even in the United States once in a while, and indeed uh, probably more in the United States in the future. But the problem is the same everywhere. Everywhere, democracy is under threat. That is, the institutions of democracy have low approval ratings. They don't seem to get to be delivering the goods. Uh, there are, it ha democracy has competition in that authoritarian regimes, like in China, and Singapore seem to be operating well in terms of their economies and delivering public policies. And people are questioning their commitment to democracy, both in practice and even in theory. They're questioning whether democracy is such a good idea. This is unprecedented in my lifetime, and I've lived longer than many of the people in this room. So my diagnosis is quite different from everybody else. And I have something very simple and hopeful to propose. But I'm interested in deliberation in a democracy where people are thinking in an evidence-based way, communicating with each other, and weighing the merits of competing policy proposals about what should be done, where the people's deliberations can actually be consequential. Imagine that. Well, it's not impossible. Uh, now, if you look at the kinds of, for a moment, imagine, the, look at the kinds of democracy we have. Party competition democracy. Parties don't want us to think, they want to win. They want to win the election. Uh, and they will do whatever they can to win negative attack ads, um, uh, misinformation on social media, whatever. That's what they are. They are machines designed to win elections. And that's fine. We hope that the competition between parties will somehow bring the issues to the fore, but increasingly, that doesn't happen. Our country was actually born in a vision not of competing political parties, but if you've read the Federalist Papers, you'll know that Madison had the idea that the representatives were supposed to refine and enlarge the public views. They were supposed to deliberate about the merits of public policy in the Senate, how long has it been since you heard anybody call the Senate the world's greatest deliberative body? That's what they used to try to call it. Right now, it's partisanship and deadlock. Uh, the Constitutional Convention. Do you know that the Electoral College was originally supposed to be a deliberative body where the electors would meet and deliberate about who was the most qualified person to be president? It worked only with one candidate, George Washington. That worked for two elections, and that was the end of that. Participatory democracy, we live in California. We have ballot propositions all the time. Uh, did anybody have any trouble figuring out the, the merits of the propositions a few days ago? Well, <laughs> we get all kinds of ads and all kinds of competing propositions and misleading. The, we don't even have political party label to help us organize our votes with participatory democracy. It's, in the New England town meeting, maybe it works, but studies show it only works in the very, very small towns, two or 300. Uh, the larger towns, uh, nobody shows up to the town meeting, and uh, there's uh, very little deliberation 
Now, there's one other kind of democracy in the toolkit. Uh, and my prescription is to take that kind of democracy, make it work, and insert it at various points in the other decisions. I've called it deliberative democracy by the people themselves to distinguish it from Madison's idea of the representatives doing all the thinking for us. But how on earth could that work? Well, that's the puzzle I want to pose to you, and then I want to show you how it actually works. Uh, well, let's skip that. Uh, that's direct democracy. Uh, by the way, the Brexit buses, as you may know, Brexit uh, was, uh, Britain voted to leave the European Union. The, uh, a lot of people attribute the decision to those ads on those buses. Let's, uh, we spend 350 million pounds a week. We send that to the EU, EU. Let's fund the NHS. That's the National Health Service instead. That's based on a technicality. Britain does send 350 million pounds a week, but you may remember Mrs. Thatcher, and she negotiated a rebate, so most of that money goes back to the UK. So there's no pile of money to put in the National Health Service. It's just a fiction that all that money went to the EU. So people wrongly voted for uh, leave without a factual basis. With a, that's the kind of misleading propaganda you always get you often get in campaigns, and um, it really has to be answered. People need both sides of the issue. So I want to ask, who is consulted in any public consultation or democratic process, and what kind of opinion do they have? And you can't just do polls. Here, let me just say something about polling, because I do uh, survey research. The problem is rational ignorance. And a political economist named Anthony Downs back in 1957 coined the term. And it's for the fact that if I have one vote in millions, why should I spend a lot of time thinking about the complexities of public policy? I've got other things to do. I've got my poetry business to run. I've got my classes to prepare for. I've got uh, my job to keep. Uh, where those things I can make more of a difference than I can in voting on uh, the insurance reform uh, that might be in a ballot proposition, or the um, uh, how to fix the healthcare system, which is so complicated that everybody can get lost in the process, or the tax reform. So it's rational to be ignorant. But unfortunately, if everybody is acting rationally and ignorant in that way, then who's thinking? Who is doing the thinking? People who are trying to influence us are doing the thinking. We've undergone a long journey from Madison, who had this vision of a republic with deliberation in the public interest, to Madison Avenue. And those of you who, anybody who's been to New York, knows that Madison Avenue is the home of the advertising industry, where people are always trying to influence you to buy cars or cigarettes or whatever it is. <clears throat> but uh, this. The theorists of democracy fully admit that the same techniques that are used to influence you to uh, buy one brand of soap rather than another are also used to influence you to vote for one candidate or one ballot proposition rather than another. I can't stop that. I can only point out that we need to supplement that with something else. So that we can, uh, the second, uh, second point is, uh, I call it phantom opinions. Um, People, if, they, if you do polling and people offer an opinion, if they haven't thought about it, they never say they don't know. Instead, they'll randomly pick a solution, uh, pick an alternative. So George Bishop at the University of Cincinnati asked people about the Public Affairs Act of 1975. People, some people approved it, some people didn't, but it was fictional. There was no Public Affairs Act of 1975. The Washington Post decided to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the non-existent Public Affairs Act of 1975 by asking people what they thought of the repeal of it. Half were told that the Democrats wanted to repeal it, half that the Republicans wanted to repeal it, and they got completely different answers as to whether it was a good idea, but it didn't exist in the first place. The third is another problem which has become even more profound. I call it selectivity of sources, but it's basically people use their freedom to talk to the like-minded. People use their social media to consult with people who agree with them. 
people use their choice in the marketplace of ideas to listen to the channels, the radio shows, the television shows uh, that they already agree with or tend to agree with, and they never hear the other side. And then they're surprised that they can't understand the people who have different views. So I have a simple solution to all of this. Uh, I call it deliberative polling. So what we do is there's some issue, and we prepare in depth the uh, uh, good materials for discussion on either side that have been vetted by the people who have different points of view and who disagree. And we develop that. We work very hard to get an evidence-based decision clear enough and simple enough and accessible enough for ordinary citizens to really consider the issues in, a, in, a, in diverse discussion groups that are moderated. And when diverse groups meet together with moderators, they are usually quite civil to each other. And one of our problems is the tendency for people who disagree just to insult each other. But it doesn't happen with us. We've even done it in Northern Ireland with Protestants and Catholics, even at points where they were close to killing each other, but not in our process. Or in Bulgaria with the Roma, uh, that is the gypsies, who were in segregated schools, and they could actually talk to people um, uh, from the broader population, and the results showed that the public would accept desegregating those schools, and that's actually happened. But let me, I'm jumping ahead. We've done this in 28 countries 109 times, uh, uh, including Europe all the Oh, this was the first. I, I can't show the video. But in Britain, we did the first one in 1994 on the issue of crime. And on that issue, uh, two things to point out. Uh, one is a random sample has great resources, and I didn't think about it, but we put the people of Britain all in one room, uh, hundreds of people, uh, uh, a microcosm of the country, divided into small groups for discussion. And I was listening to one of the small groups, and there was a car thief in the group. And I had, if you have a, if you have a good sample, you'll have criminals in the sample. And he was contributing to the discussion about why people commit. He added to the discussion. He was actually he added something. And then there was a woman who was part of that group. Oh, who was the spouse accompanying her husband, and she came up to thank me at the party uh, uh, that the, because this was a whole weekend. These things usually are a whole weekend. And she said she wanted to thank me. Why? In 30 years of marriage, her husband had never read a newspaper, she said. But from the moment he was invited to this, he started to read every newspaper every day, and he was going to be much more interesting to live with in retirement. <laughs> and so, then I realized we had a way of overcoming rational ignorance, because if you're one person in a group of 15 and one person in a sample of 300, 400, 500, your voice counts. It's not like one person out of millions and millions of people, particularly since the thing was televised nationally and it was, uh, there were important politicians in the dialogue like Tony Blair and others at that first one. But it was, and now our projects are part of decision processes. Now, that's a photo I took in Athens of the random sampling machine, the Claritarian that they used, because the Athenians actually took random samples of 500 to make important decisions. I don't have much time. Oh, we brought that back to Athens. That's George Papandreou, the former prime minister, who you, we used to select candidates. We've done it big scale. That's the parliament building of the European Union. In Brussels, Europe, the European Union has 500 million people, a lot bigger than the US. And that's, those are the members of our sample from all uh, 27 countries. Now they're 28. And they, oh, they, they spoke to each other in all the languages, 22 languages, actually 21 because the Irish all insisted on speaking English. But they could have spoken Gaelic through the, uh, the uh, interpretation mechanisms. And we got great results. The people could understand each other, communicate, and we got results about what should be done. The same in China. I think I'm, how much time do I have? Oh, we only got, I don't have much time at all. Japan was used for the pension system. Here, I want to speed ahead. South Korea just used it a few weeks ago to decide whether or not to build, continue building two nuclear reactors. Uh, which the government leans anti-nuclear, the public leans anti-nuclear, but the previous government had spent a hell of a lot of money building those two nuclear reactors. 
to everyone's surprise, the people moved to say, OK, build them. Don't build any more, but finish building them. We need the energy, and it's clean energy. It doesn't have greenhouse gases. And so the government accepted that. Well, that's Bulgaria with the Roma, with the, led in part to the desegregation, Northern Ireland. Uh, in Texas, we did a whole series of projects where the question was, will the public, what kind of energy do you want uh, in each part of Texas in terms of, um, to get your electricity? Do you want coal, natural gas, wind power? Do you want to invest in conservation? Do you want to pipe the energy in from Mexico? And the public was willing to pay more from 52% to 84% in eight different projects. The public was willing to pay a little bit more on their bill to support wind power. And Texas went, as a result of the filings based on this data and related data, from at the start, it was last in the United States in terms of the amount of wind power. Now it's the first, surpassed California in 2007. The people were willing to pay a little bit more on their monthly bill because the wind power was clean and it was good for the environment. And the coal had all kinds of problems in terms of um, socks and knocks and you know, acid rain and uh, various things. So, so the people went in thinking, I want the cheapest electricity I can get. They went out saying, this is good for the community. I'm willing to pay a little bit more. And now the wind power is so cost effective, you don't need to, to charge any more for it. Uh, Mongolia has passed a law requiring deliberative polling, my term, before the country can consider a constitutional amendment. Uh, that's, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in that picture in the very back. You can't see me. But that's the, that's the government palace in Ulaanbaatar. That big figure there is Genghis Khan, uh, who presides over the whole country. And what happened is that's an almost perfect sample. Only two people refused the interview, the initial interview. The, the sampling, government, the government statistic office selected the people. And uh, 700 people, and they considered uh, proposals to change the way the president is elected, the proposals to uh, uh, add a second chamber, and most importantly, proposals to um, uh, have a, um, an independent civil service and, a, and an independent judiciary beyond corruption. Some of the proposals I thought were very strange because they came out of a lot of consultation before they went into this. One of the proposals was put the names of the government ministries in the Constitution. I said, what? It turned out that what happens is they have, it's a democracy. It's got two political parties that are at each other's throat all the time. The, the control of the government goes back and forth between the two parties. And uh, when the, um, uh, uh, another, a new party comes in, what they do is they change the name of each of the ministries and then they fire all the people because they say the ministry of XYZ no longer exists. We're now going to call it the ministry of ABC. And so then they put new people in. So the people didn't like that. They didn't want political appointments. We wanted, they wanted career civil servants, professional appointments who would deliver public services. And that's what they'll have with this amendment. But there's a bunch of amendments. Now the parliament is going to meet in September to consider the uh, results of all this. And I believe it's going to pass this. And after Brexit, there's no more talk of making it a referendum. <laughs> the, the parliament's going to decide, I, I believe. Uh, uh, I can't go through this except to say, you can see all of this in this book, Democracy When the People Are Thinking. And one of my biggest hopes is to do uh, this at the beginning of the next presidential selection season. We've done a lot of projects with PBS over the years on different topics, uh, including one in California that provided some input to some at least reasonable and modest changes to the initiative system. Now it's much easier for you to find out who's paying for an initiative, who's opposing it, and an initiative can be revised once the signatures have been collected. Uh, there's a process of doing that and a few other uh, changes. Uh, modest changes, but changes. We've been doing this here in California. I'd like to do it nationally, but, um, and so we're in serious discussions, so stay tuned. That idea and many others are, 
are outlined in the book. And I'm out of time. Thank you so much.